You're listening to the Redemption Church Podcast with Pastor Daniel Williams as we study through the book of 1 John in a series called Walk in Love. So if you have a Bible right now, turn to 1 John chapter 5. Um, If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand. We'd love to give you one or on your way out at the resource table. You can go ahead and grab one. If it's a Bible we gave you, it's page 1023. Okay, it's a New Testament book. It's by the Apostle John, who was changed in, uh, really by Jesus. He's known as the, the Apostle of Love, and he's teaching people what it is like to live for God, to understand his love. And, and this message I'm going to call it is, Do You Have Life? Do you have life? John is going to ask sort of a question and bring up some of the same truths that we've been studying about light, about love, about Jesus and who he is as the son of God and and how he satisfies and how he's good and we can be thankful for it. But but, but I wanted to to sort of put it in a phrase of a question this week. Questions help us process and they help us learn. And John throughout this book has been bringing up questions. He's bringing up statements, imperatives, things that are true, absolutely. But now he's going to bring up some questions and say, hey, do you have life? Do you, have you experienced this? Do you know uh, that you are saved? Do you know that you have, are walking in this love? And questions are really good. You see this throughout the life of Jesus and his ministry. He, he asked a lot of questions. And listen, Jesus knew the truth, right? He, the Bible says he's full of grace and truth. But yet, he would help people process, especially his disciples, what was going on by asking them questions. And so John is doing the same thing because he wants to help us process, what does it mean to walk in love? How do we truly love one another? Right? He's already stated this fact. This is chapter 5. It's the last chapter. We're going to do half the chapter this week and the next chapter um, next week, and then we'll be done. But, but he, just, he wants to sort of you meditate on things and say the same thing over and over again in different sort of angles so you can comprehend it, so you can apply it, so you can meditate on it. So we're not just so quick to rush on about God's love. And so we're going to do like we always do. We're going to read the scripture. We're going to pray and ask God to speak to us. And then we'll, we'll study it and break it down. And so uh, John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. I'll have the words on the screen. You have your own phones and Bibles there. And uh, we'll read along and then pray. The apostle John says, to the church and to us, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love of God that we keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the, Holy, and the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. Verse 7, for there are three that testify, speaking of the, the water, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the water, the blood, and these three agree. If we receive testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he was born concerning the Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe, believes God, has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. As always, it's sort of overwhelming sometimes to just read a big section of Scripture, but don't worry. We're going to take this, our time, process it, meditate on it, and study through it. And so let's ask God to speak to us. Jesus, we thank you that you are the Son of God. We thank you, Lord, that you are here in our midst, that you are alive. That you not only died, but you rose again, and you're working in our lives, God. And you know every single person here. And so I ask, Lord, that your spirit would minister. That you would allow me to teach your word in a prophetic way that would touch hearts. Lord, thank you that you know us all. You care about us all. You, you understand where we're at. And I just pray, God, that you would continue to help us to realize who you are, God, as the Son of God. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son as an act of love. Thank you for showing and demonstrating your love for us. And so help us to walk in your love. God, help us to know that we have life. 
Help us to answer this question with confidence. Do we have life? I pray for everyone here that we would be able to say yes. Yes, we know we have life because we know we have the Son. And so, Holy Spirit, do a work that only you can do. Let us see more of Jesus. Let us worship you now with our minds. And we ask, Lord, that you be glorified. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, the Apostle John in this short little letter says the word no 39 times. He wants us to know something. Just alone in this chapter, this word no is mentioned eight times. And he clearly wants us to base our lives on an information, this eternal truth. Matter of fact, if you look in your Bible, the very next verse in verse 13 that we didn't read, it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Here's a beautiful thing about our God. He speaks and he gives life. He allows us to walk in light and to understand things. And he gives us his word. And the word of God addresses key and real issues, helpful topics that we should know. You and I should know about things. And yes, the word of God points us to Jesus, but it also gives us instruction, law, precepts, morals, things that we can base our life upon to understand how to actually walk in this dark world. The Apostle Paul would have language like this. If, if you read the, the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, this topic of spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. One translation says ignorant. So I'm going to write and pin these things so that you would have this information so you could understand what it is and live accordingly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul would write again, we, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, or ignorant, brothers, but to those, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others, but you may have hope. The Apostle Paul, John, Peter, they would write these things to remind us, to instruct us, to give us an understanding of eternal truths. And although these are eternal truths and they last for all eternity, they apply right here, right now. And so John wants us to know. He wants us through this book to give us an insurance of our salvation, of things that we could know, that we could know truth, that we could know good and evil, that we could know God and we could know God's love. And so in this text, I want to just sort of take you through that, that sort of mindset of things that we can know. We can could, we could know that we have life because he's going to bring up the question, hey, do you have life? If you have the son, you do. If you don't, then you don't. If you don't have the son, then you don't. And he's bringing up these questions to stir up emotion to say, hey, you know what? You can have some confidence when, you, when, when the enemy comes in and, and has questions and doubts. We can actually know things. We can know things about God. We can know things about instruction of how to raise our kids, of marriage, of how to work. All these different things. Everything between, pertaining life and godliness, Peter says, has been given to us in the word of God. And so the first thing is this. You could, you could know you have life because you will have a new nature. John is trying to, to bring this about. And, and he says in verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now John mentions being born again throughout this book. 1 John 2.29, 1 John 3.9, 1 John 4.7. Almost every chapter he talks about this, this experience that when you trust in Jesus, you are made spiritually alive, that you've been snatched from darkness into light, that, that God is your Father, that we are loved. And he's trying to make sure that we understand not just that we are born again, but how do you become born again? It is through Jesus. Now the Bible says that we are spiritually dead in sin and our spirits are dead without God. Ephesians 2, 1 says, You were dead in trespasses and sins. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, speaking of Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. And so because of this sin nature that we're born into, that we do by omission and commission, we see what's right and we can't even do it. And we, we know that, that that thing's wrong, but then we end up doing it. And, and, and there's these things that make us spiritually dead. We are separated from God. But the text doesn't just go on in there. Because God in his mercy and his grace has made us spiritually alive in Christ. Giving us a new nature and forgiving our sins when we turn to him because of the work that he's done. And that same, same passage I just read to you about how we have a, a sin nature, that we're a born children of wrath. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul would go on and say, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love that which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. In Romans chapter 5, after Paul brings out the, the fact that we've been inherited this, imputed this sin, we've also been imputed some righteousness through Jesus. Romans 5, 18 through 21, Paul would go on about this topic and say, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, speaking of Adam, so by now one man's obedience, the many were made righteous, speaking of Jesus. Now the law came in to increase trespass, but where sin increased, grace abound all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus our Lord. John is trying to say this. You were made alive when you have life. You could know that you have life because you will have a new nature. You will be spiritually alive when you put your trust, your faith, your hope, your desire, your, your everything into Jesus. He will make you new. This is the good news of the gospel. There is some bad news. There is the wrath of God, but there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ because he now gives us his righteousness. He imputes his righteousness in us. He declares that we are righteous. That means justification, just as if I didn't sin. See, the gospel doesn't make bad people good people. That is a heresy. We are all dead, deserving death and the wrath of God. The gospel makes dead people alive people. We are spiritually dead, separated from God, and it is through faith that we are made alive. You know, I've even met and talked with and worked with people that have grown up in a religious background um, and, and maybe even um, different church settings. And they say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just not one of those, those born-again Christians. Like, I've literally had conversations with that. And, and the Bible would say, you can't be any other Christian. You're either left or right. You're either dark or in light. You are either born again or you are not born again. You are alive or you are dead. This is not behavior modification. This isn't a religion. When you have life, you have a relationship with Jesus and he forgives your sin and gives you his spirit. You become a child of God. John would say this in John chapter 1 verse 12. Whoever received him, he became the right to become children of God. And your desires change. You actually become spiritually alive. Jesus bringing up the subject of being born again to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, we see that Jesus taught this, that we were spiritually dead and needed to be spiritually alive. In John 3, 3, he answered Nicodemus, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He would go on to this religious leader, this one that would know all scripture and the Old Testament, and he would tell Nicodemus in verse 7, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. See, do you guys understand that there is something supernaturally that takes place when you put your faith in Jesus? When you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord and died and rose again for your sins, there's something that shifts. All of heaven rejoices and heaven moves because the work of God that was done on the cross, he died for your sin and now he gives full forgiveness for everyone, for all your sin. And something supernaturally takes place. This is why Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old have passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do you have this life? Do you have this new nature? And see, being born again, John gives us two side effects, two implications of what this looks like in your life. He says this, you're going to love God and you're going to love other people. Isn't that the greatest command? I mean, wouldn't Jesus say all the law is summed up in this? But Jesus goes on and tells us that, listen, when we're born again, our whole life will change. That God actually writes the law in our hearts. That there's something that takes place within our spirit. That regeneration, that being alive. And so the apostle goes on and says, hey, everyone who believes in the Son, you're going to be born again. But look in verse 1, he continues to goes on. He says, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the the children of God, when we love God and obey his commands, for this is the love of God that we keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome. We're going to want to start obeying our Father. Our desires are going to change to not a have to, but a get to, that we're going to desire to worship God. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And listen, this does not mean we're going to be perfect. Because hasn't John already addressed this starting in chapter 1 that no one is perfect? 
that we won't be perfect, but our desires, our heart, our lives will start to transform, become more and more like Christ. And we even see this great struggle. Sometimes it gives us hope in the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 7, he said, man, the things that I want to do, I end up not doing. There's this battle going on. There's this old man and this new man, this, this flesh that I am. But yet there's some, my spirit is alive. And so I, I want to obey God, but then I end up stumbling or I see what's, what's right, and then I end up can't doing that. And this is why John says in very chapter 1, he says, it's okay, Christian, you can confess your sins. Because he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. We come in agreement with God in humility and say, hey, we're not perfect, but Lord, I want to obey you. Help me. I want you in my life. I want to worship you. I, I have this desire. I have this obedience, this heart that's transformed. And now I want to act in a way that honors you that serves you, that loves you. Our love for God should cause us to act a certain way and cause our hearts to be transformed. A couple of quotes for you. Boynt, the commentator, says, Christians frequently attempt to turn the love of God into a mushy emotional experience. But John does not allow this in his epistle. Love for God will show itself in obedience. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, often said that every Bible should be bound in shoe leather, meaning that we should be applying what we're learning not just this mind thing, not just this studious thing, but something that applies to our hearts. Warren Wiersbe said, we show our love to God, not with empty words, but by willing works. We are not slaves obeying a master anymore. We are children obeying our father. And these may be quotes, but when I was studying and thinking about this, it made me think of a story back in the Old Testament uh, in Genesis chapter 28. Jacob and, and Rachel and the Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel, but Rachel's dad was like, no, no, no you can't have her. Here's the price. You, you got you to gotta work for me seven years. And you know what's crazy? In that text, the Bible gives us some insight, the power of love. It said that Jacob worked seven years, but it seemed like a day to him, a day. John is saying, hey, when you love someone, it's not like these are commands, these these these." These rules are like a burdensome. It's not like, it's a delight. It's easy because, because you love. And remember, this is a gospel. This is the good news. This is a letter to a church saying you need to walk in love. We obey because we love, because we have this new nature. And just like Jacob loved Rachel and he, and he served her and worked, we, we're to love God and we're to serve him and to work for him. And where this includes our love for other people. We not only love God, but it plays out with people, with our enemies, with Christians, with believers, with people in our community, in our workplace, that there is an abiding relationship with God himself that actually flows out into other people. And this is why it's so important to cultivate a love for God. To cultivate a love for God, not just coming to a service, not just an attendance thing, but to worship God on a Tuesday at lunchtime. To read the Bible on a Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. before you go to work. To give thanks to God on a Friday for the weekend because you know you get to spend time with your family. That God is everything to you and you now have access because you have this new nature. You have this confidence that, that when you pray, he listens and, and that he loves you and you love him. And, and so you have to cultivate that relationship, meaning spending time with him. Just as you spend time with your, your spouse or maybe your really close friend, someone you're caring about. You want to spend time with him to cultivate that. And as you do that, you get to know him and love him more because out of that love and that relationship with God, it affects everything, including your love for other people. John says you should have a love for other brothers, other Christians, other family members. David Guzik in his commentary said, when our love and obedience for God grows cold, we do not only harm ourselves, we harm our brothers and our sisters also. And so John doesn't want that. He wants us to know that we can have life. And, and he wants us to know that, man, this knowledge, this love relationship with God affects our lives. Jesus said in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. His commands are not burdensome because we've been born again. We've been given new hearts. And so our hearts instinctively wish to please God. And this is a part of the new covenant. The law of God has been written into our hearts. And it was prophesied that this would happen in Jeremiah 31, 33. In Ezekiel, Jeremiah would say it this way, For this is the covenant that I have made with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law 
within them. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I know sometimes people say, well, they just, they just raised their hand. They just said a simple prayer. No, something supernatural happens when you submit your life to Jesus Christ. You become born again. And listen, the only way that you have these desires, this passion, this love for God is through faith. Look at verses 4 through 5. It's only by faith. Our salvation, our new nature is by grace through faith. Works are important in our walk with God. Obeying and loving Him are important. But receiving this new nature, John doesn't want you to be mistaken. He says it's by faith and faith alone. Just like in the same text in Ephesians 2 verse 1 says we have a sin nature. In verse 4 and 5, but God in His great mercy saved us by His grace. Paul continues the same thought in the same chapter. In verse 8 and 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so John, in his thinking and his reasoning, of speaking of this subject in verses 4 and 5, he says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, has victory. And this victory that has overcome the world is our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And the answer is no one. We only overcome through the faith in Christ because Christ had the final victory on the cross. He said it was finished. You can't add to the work of Christ. You can't, you can't get yourself to glory or perfection. You've been stained. You fall short of God's glory. And you need His forgiveness and His mercy and His love. And the only way that you can receive that is by receiving that. The Bible even goes so strong in Romans 11.6. It says, listen, you can't add to grace. If you could, it wouldn't be grace. It's a gift. This is how we define it. It's unearned favor. Unearned. Meaning you can't like weigh the balance and the scales. You are dead. Dead people do nothing. They are dead. But God gives us a gift of grace. He died in our place and now gives us righteousness. This great substitute, imputation of righteousness to us. You know, Spurgeon said about faith this. Look at any Greek lexicon you like and you will find the word faith or believe. It does not merely mean to believe, but to trust, to confide in, to commit to to entrust with, and so forth. The very marrow of meaning of faith is a confidence in, a reliance upon. When the Bible says that we are to have faith, it means that we are to have a confidence, a trust, a reliance upon Jesus and the work that he did on the cross, dying and then three days later rising again. And this is really baptism, right? We identify with the work that Jesus did that it is not of our own self, but it is of Lord. And this is why Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so now through our faith, we can overcome the world. We can have God's grace that is greater than our sin be imputed to us as righteousness as we abide in Christ. We overcome in Jesus. We don't overcome in, as Christians by tithing more or giving more or our Sunday attendance. It doesn't work that way. We're righteous, we're holy because of Jesus and the work he did. In Christ, all spiritual blessings are found. And you know, when you know you're going to win, I'm just, I'm just saying this, when you know you're, like if you're a sports fan, you know this. When you know you're going to win, it just brings so much confidence, doesn't it? I mean, have you ever, have you ever played a middle schooler? I have. My son's 11, okay? I don't worry about the game. I'm hanging out. I'm playing. Sure, does he score? Okay, great. Awesome, yeah. But if I want to take over and block a shot, don't you think I can? I'm just saying. I'm just throwing that out there for you. We, we, yeah, for now. When you know you have confidence, or when you know that you're going to win, it brings confidence. It brings peace. It brings joy. You realize that the Bible says that we're going to win. That this is not the end. That heaven is real. And sure, there, there, there may be battles and struggles and the enemy is real and hurt is hard and, and pain is real and there is a struggle. But we don't walk in darkness. We walk in light. And so part of the fruit of the Spirit, trusting in Jesus, is what? We get some patience. We get some peace. We get some joy. Because we know that we have victory, not in our behavior, but in Jesus. 
And he is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us that we would have strength to just continue to abide in him because that's where the fruit is. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed in us. When we understand this, we overcome. It's not that we don't go through struggle. Jesus did say, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome. You will have struggle as a Christian. You will have disappointment. People will let you down. People will sin against you. But be of good cheer, for you can overcome in Jesus. Because your behavior doesn't dictate how God looks at you. It's an unconditional love. It's an agape love. Meaning it doesn't go away if you're bad or you're good. John already addressed this. God is love. He loves you and he loves me. And he demonstrated that love, John says, on the cross by dying for our sins. And so we could either now receive it by faith or reject it by faith. But that eternal truth is a reality that you need to settle in your mind. You have this life. You can by faith. And you can know you have life by trusting in God's testimony. Not only is it a new nature, but John says that in verse 6 through 9 that, that God has spoken some truth. He testifies of this truth that you can have life. Because God said it, you can know it. Because God said it, it will take place. And you will overcome if you have faith trusting in what God has said. We have faith not based on our feelings. We have faith based on God's word and what he has said. And he says you can have eternal life. He has testified that you can have victory in Jesus Christ. Listen to verse 6 through 9. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies. Because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, which we do, the testimony of God is greater. And this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Do you realize that God has testified that Jesus is the Son of God, that these things are true? Jesus really came in history. He really died. He really rose again. He was really fully man and fully God. And John tells us that three things testify of this fact that Jesus can be our Savior and He can be our hope. He can be our Lord. Water, blood, and the Holy Spirit. Now there are different interpretations of these things. It's a little bit confusing. But I I think that water most likely refers to Jesus' baptism. You remember the story in the text in Matthew chapter 3 when Jesus first started His ministry. John the Baptist was out there baptizing him. And, and the text says, When Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, becoming rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said this, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. The Father, God himself, let us know at Jesus' baptism, the very start of his ministry, that he was his Son. That he was approved that we should worship him by water. But what about blood? Most likely this refers to the death of Jesus on the cross. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 54, this is the account of Jesus after he yielded up his spirit on this great miracle that our sins were placed on him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were open. I love this because I don't know, I have no idea how to explain it. And many bodies of the saints had fallen asleep, were raised. A miracle. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the satyrian and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw this earthquake and saw all this stuff happen, the text says what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this is the Son of God. It's almost as if these miracles, the, the night going black, the curtain being torn, people rising, from the, this was all testifying that this was the Son of God. Creation was responding to Jesus' death and even people that witnessed it testified this, this must be more than a man. This is the Son of God. And so we have 
testimonies like the water and the blood, which were external testimonies. Other people testified, saw these things take place. Even the great Josephus, who just is a, not a believer, but just records history, testifies of these supernatural things happening, like the earthquakes and the, the night of darkness and these things. But John says, but then you also have the testimony of God himself, the Holy Spirit. Not just external testimonies, but an internal testimony. The Holy Spirit, by, Spirit testifies internally of who Jesus is in your heart. You could know. Romans 8.16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's something that brings a peace, a confirmation. See, the Spirit's main role is to point us to Jesus Christ, as Jesus said in John 15 and 16. And he points to us that Jesus is God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he teaches us and reveals more and more of who Jesus is. God has testified of these things. We can trust him. Warren Wearsby, a commentator on this, said, the law required two or three witnesses for a matter to be settled, found in Deuteronomy 19.15. Well, in this text, the Father witnessed at the baptism and at the cross, and the Spirit witnesses today within every believer. The Spirit, the water, and the blood settle the matter. Jesus is God. And so John wants us to know this thing. Do we have life? We, we, we have a new nature if we believe in Christ. We, we have God's testimony confirming through His Spirit and, and external signs. But lastly, we can know we have life because the reality is Jesus is life. Life is in Jesus. It's who he says he is. All things were made by him, for him. In him, everything exists. And John goes on to explain this in, in verse 10 through 12. Whoever believes in the Son has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony has borne concerning his Son. You either believe it or you're not. And if you don't, you call God a liar. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. John wants you to make a decision. Do you believe in Jesus as your source of life or not? Is he the Son of God or not? Is he your God or not? If yes, you could know that you have life. Because you now have an experience, a relationship with life. With the source of life. With the creator of everything. That Who knows you before you were even born? Who knows you when you were in your mother's wombs? Who knows you when you were uncomfortable and in pain and in suffering? He walked with you as a good shepherd. The life is in Jesus. And you can experience this life. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. John wants you to give, give you that assurance, give you that, give you that understanding that when you believe, when you trust, when you confide, when you abide, when you go to Jesus, you are going to the source of life, the source of hope, the source of love. John 3, 36, John would commentate after the passage of being born again. He would say this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Why? Because he's trying to prove himself. He's trying to earn it. But that's not how the wrath of God leaves us. It's by faith, and we overcome through Jesus and the work that he did. For on the cross, the wrath of God was placed on Jesus for our sins. And three days later, it was proven to us, declared that we were righteous because God is now alive and promises to give us new life, an eternal life. And eternal life is knowing him. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus would say, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Well, what does that mean? That means John has already addressed it in 1 John 3, 3, that like when, when he appears, we are going to be made like him. That we are going to have resurrected bodies like Jesus. That, that although we will die, we won't go into the second judgment, the second death. We will actually get a new body, be with him for all eternity. That Jesus has come that we may have a life and life more abundantly. That we can experience eternal life, not just in heaven over there, but right 
now because Jesus is life. This is why John closes this epistle. says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Don't turn to other things. Turn, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn to Jesus. Believe in him. Trust in him. And if you do, you could know that you have life. If we abide in Jesus, make him our God. Trust, confine, a promise, put our faith in his promises, we will have eternal life and we can know. And so John, once again, gets us to a place where we have to turn to Jesus and his love. And he asks us, do you have life? And it all starts and ends with Jesus. You have to decide to accept him or to reject him. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30 through 31, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven by pe- forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. What is that blasphemy of the Spirit? Well, John fifteen twenty six, John 16 tells us the Spirit of God points us to Jesus. That we, our, our judgment is going to be whether on if we believe Jesus or not. If we reset, accept this free gift of life from Jesus. And this is why Jesus and his ministry began by saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. There is a way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You could know that you can have life because you could know Jesus. And Jesus wants to know us. This is what Christmas is all about. God with us, Emmanuel. It literally says he came to take away the sins of the world. Do you have any sin? There's no condemnation in Christ. None. There's no condemnation in Christ. And so John throughout this book is saying, you want to know love? You want to experience life? You want hope? You want some joy? You, you want to walk in light as he is in light? You need to go to Jesus. The Bible tells us to repent for today is a day of salvation. And we need to constantly be abiding in Jesus, pursuing him. And so don't leave here thinking, well, I don't know, should I or should I not? Or I don't, I don't know, I've been a Christian, but I, I messed up this week. And so I, I don't know what that's going to be like. No, the Bible says that you can know that you have life. Because today you could turn to Jesus. You can worship him. The Bible says that when, when Jesus says that he cast no one away. I love that verse in John. It literally says he will turn no one away that comes to him. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. The Bible is not trying to make you a better person. He's trying to make you a live person, to connect you to your Savior. This is the good news that we don't have a works-based performance relationship with God the Father. He loves us unconditionally, and that love is poured into our hearts, and it affects everything about us, even so much so that we're able to love other people. And so John would say, do you have life? If not, you can today. Turn to Jesus. Believe in your heart. Confess through the mouth that he died and rose again. You shall be saved. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much that we can turn to you. We thank you so much that that you're a loving God, that there is no condemnation in you, that you are full of grace and full of truth. You are great and you are holy and you are mighty. I thank you, Lord, that you cast no one away. Like 1 John 2, 2 says that you died for all the sins of the world. That there is an open invitation to come and feast with you and know you and accept you and have a relationship with you. God, and we pray, Lord, that those listening to this that are here in this room, that if they don't know you, they would come and turn to you. And the Bible wants you to know that God does love you and you can know him. Even by believing in your heart and saying a simple prayer, you could just simply say, Jesus, I need you. I turn to you today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want this eternal life. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you. Be my Lord and my God. The Bible says that when you turn to him, when you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that all of heaven rejoices over one sinner repenting. And so God, we want to repent and turn to you. We want to give you our hearts and give you our lives. We want to remember your great love by taking communion, by remembering that we're saved by grace through faith. That is not a work of ourselves. Jesus, you told us to, to as we gather to remember, Lord, it's not by our might, but by your spirit to remember the work of salvation that you died for our sins and Lord that you will come back again what a great sacrifice what a great demonstration of love Lord help us to respond by faith 
to remember this great sacrifice, this great love that you have. And Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that we would continue to abide, to trust, to rely on you. Thank you that we can know you, not just with our heads, but with our hearts, with our entire lives. So help us to continue to know you, to continue to abide, to continue to grow in our relationship with you, Lord, and continue to help us to love you and other people. We thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for this letter and how we can look and study your word. You want us to know things, and so may we continue to turn to you, Lord. We ask all these things in your precious name, God. Amen. This is Pastor Daniel Williams with Redemption Church. Thank you so much for listening to this message. You can subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube, so you never miss a message. The mission of Redemption Church is to pursue and to proclaim Jesus, and we would love to have you partner with us. Feel free to share these messages with your family and friends. And also, if you'd like to donate to the ministry, go to redemptiondb.com. God bless you.